Good morning, everyone. I'm going to stand for just a minute, and then I'll sit down and join the panelists. It is exciting to be here, and it's truly an exciting time in medical research and science. This conference, this convening, is, is clearly a testament to that. And so are the many advances in various areas of medical research. <clears throat> in oncology, as many of you know, and some of you probably have already been touched, we have seen immunotherapy sweep through like a wildfire. But the seeds of this intervention were actually planted a long time ago, as in many of the advances that we'll be talking about. The promise we saw not that long ago, beginning in melanoma, now offers up promise to numerous other cancers. But even then, we need to better understand that recipe and why things are working for some, but not for all. So the science must continue into the future. We've literally arrived at the doorstep of precision medicine, and we have the President's Precision Medicine Initiative underway. I'm sure you'll hear about that throughout the day. We have disease foundations, some of you represented here and I'm sure watching, who are looking at this approach and trying to figure out how they can play a role in activating the patients that we've already been hearing about and bringing them forward to access their data and share it in partnership with the researchers. So I know we've been on the cusp of this for years, and it feels like we've been talking about all of this promise, but doesn't it finally feel like we can almost reach it, we can almost touch it? Anyone who has been a patient knows we have room, though, for improvement, and we're going to hear about some of those stories today. The ability to take science and apply it to treatments and prevention, and then bring it, it uh, together with what we know about genes, the environment, lifestyle, all are going to get us towards the ultimate finish line, which is care that is a little bit more individualized than what we can offer today. It also leads us to data, which we'll hear a lot about today, I'm sure. We see the power of big data in every single aspect of our lives. In some cases, though, I feel like that, that data, that power of data, is already harnessed a little bit more precisely for us in areas that are perhaps less important. Like when I search for cat food, and every time I go on the internet, my cat food pops up and tells me what kind of cat food my kitty cat Jinxie and Chessie like. Um, or you watch one romantic comedy, and forevermore you're branded on Netflix, and you're always going to see that type of movie. So all data is not created equal, though, and we need to make sure that it's interoperable. So today's panel is a chance to talk about what we're doing today in science and medical research to further outcomes for tomorrow. So guess what? We have people on this panel who represent just about every sector, and most of them are wearing multiple hats. I want to start with a story, though. It's a story of tenacity, and it's a story of problem solving. And you've already heard a little bit about that problem solving spirit, and I think you're going to hear more. There was a woman who once went on a date with someone, he noticed his date, uh, the gentleman that she went on a date with, noticed that his date wore a pager. And since it was in the year 2013, I believe, he found this was a bit odd since we were past that sort of 1990s pager era of technology. It ended up this person was wearing an insulin pump, and she also had in her purse another device to monitor her glucose levels. The importance of these devices uh, were critical to her life, but very critical at night, when an alarm would sound if things were out of, out of kilter. The problem was hearing the alarm and having it be loud enough to wake that person up. So that person is on the stage today, and you're going to be hearing about the journey that she took to change the face of interventions for type 1 diabetes. So I'm going to start and introduce my panel, and that person is Dana Lewis. She is the founder of Open APS and believes passionately in patients owning their own data. She started out in this space by building her own do-it-yourself artificial pancreas, and then she's founded an open source movement. Welcome, Dana. And we, we want to hear more about that story. Uh, next, we have James Park, and James is the CEO, president, and co-founder of a company that I would imagine many of you have been touched by, literally. Uh, James founded Fitbit. And he founded this company, James, I understand when you felt a little bit out of shape and wanted to try to understand how you might uh, step it up a little bit, so to speak. Uh, Fitbit went public in June 2015, and it has sold over 30 million of these wristbands, clip-ons, and I know that you're very actively thinking about the future. Uh, we then have Frida Lewis Hall, 
Uh, Dr. Lewis Hall is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at Pfizer, where she leads Pfizer Medical, the division responsible for safe, effective, appropriate uses of vaccines and medicines. Uh, Frida got her start in the field of psychiatry uh, and has had numerous different um, lifetimes, so to speak, in one life, serving on multiple federal committees, working on community health, uh, and coming into your television set through a TV show called The Doctors. So Frida's gonna be bringing us a variety of perspectives. Um, last, but by no means least, we have David Aconquo, who is the clinical director of the Brain Trauma Research Center right here at the University of Pittsburgh, and I think you had to travel perhaps the least uh, to join us today. He is the executive vice president for clinical affairs and the PI for a major study on the pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury. And I think, David, you will offer up a lot of perspectives, but most importantly, uh, the power of the need that we have out there to solve these problems for patients today. Um, you witness that, I would imagine, every day in your care delivery. So let's start. Uh, I want to conjure up the image of what people think science is. So for those of you either out there in the audience or those of you watching, um, you think of a laboratory today. If you're not a scientist, you might think of somebody walking around in a white coat. Uh, maybe there's a helix, Dr. Collins, it's over there in the corner. Maybe there's a little robot like we see at NCATS, um, you know, test tubes, pipettes. Uh, if you're my daughter, you're saying, ooh, if there's some sort of, you know, something to be dissected. Um, so that's science to people, right? But what you've already heard just in terms of these introductions is that science is happening all over the place. It's happening in people's homes, their garages, uh, it's happening online, it's happening virtually, it's happening when we all sort of slap on our wearables and, and think about, you know, our personal health when we go to the doctors as well. So I want to start with each person on the panel thinking about how we can push forward the new image of science and how we can build science capacity for the future of health. So Dana, I'll start with you since I um, sort of gave your story a little bit of a preview. Tell us about where you see the future of health and science going and then I'm going to sit down and join you guys. Well, I'm so glad you told that story and, and gave the perspective. For me, science is my living room. And it was my apartment when I started asking questions about why data didn't move between one medical device and my other. Um, and actually, my now husband was the one asking those questions, and I just rolled my eyes because I'm a patient. I'm, I'm so used after 10 years to not having my data move between devices, and that's just the way it is. But when we were in my living room and started asking questions about, well, why not? What if we could bridge the gap? What if we could use off-the-shelf computing hardware that you buy on Amazon? And the answer is what's clipped to my pocket, which is now the artificial pancreas. It uses the existing insulin pump and continuous glucose monitor and bridges the data and allows us to put our algorithm on it and it just works. So to me, that is the future of science and the future of healthcare, which is enabling this innovation in unexpected places and knowing it's going to come from the patient and the people who are closest to the problems. Though they may not be a mechanical engineer, but that doesn't mean they can't engineer a solution that is going to change our future. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, James, can you talk about what the future of health and science looks like from your vantage point? Yeah, I think similar themes. Um, you know, th there's a few thoughts that come to mind. One is, and, and this is happening right now, but a lot of shifting of thinking from uh, treatment of diseases to uh, more about prevention. And I think there's elements of that, you know, particularly in the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, you know, we talk about the cancer moonshot, but I think one of the things that I'd love to see is, look, a lot of, a lot of different types of cancers, you know, can be preventable through lifestyle, you know, changes in lifestyle behavior. And, you know, one of the things that is encouraging to me is that there's a lot more awareness of that fact. We don't have to spend billions of dollars on, you know, different types of drugs and treatments, you know, post-diagnosis. We can actually keep people from getting to that point in the first place. Um, the second theme for me is access to data. I think, you know, a few people have spoken about it already, but, you know, and, and I concur with, uh, you know, the, the notion that access to this diff data is, for some reason, extraordinarily difficult. I mean, there's actually startups being funded in Silicon Valley right now where their sole job is to, uh, on behalf of a patient, manually go around and ask different hospitals, labs, other providers for patients' own data, and they get it on CD-ROMs. You know, part of what you're paying for for these startups is, you know, they're actually 
somehow converting all the data from the CD-ROM and putting it into a more accessible form. Uh, they're getting faxes from doctors and then, you know, digitizing them. If you think about Microsoft Health Vault, back then I think a lot of, you know, what they did in terms of technology was develop, you know, fax drivers so they could automate the process of, like, getting faxes from doctors and converting them into digital form. So, uh, you know, this inability to access data is, is, is kind of incredible. And I think the third theme is kind of related to that, which is uh, consumer and patient engagement. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of great solutions that uh, have a lot of great technology behind them, but without um, consumers being uh, actively engaged in managing their own care and being interested in it, I think you know, you're missing a huge part of the, the solution. Thank you. Frida, I would imagine that you're not relying on faxes so heavily right now at Pfizer, I would hope. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Talk about your perspectives, you know, from your current vantage point, but, you know, your, your career and your body of work. What is the future of health and science, and what does that intersection look like? Um, I think there are a couple of things. One is... Um, as I look in this room, if I think about outside of this room, we continue to work in verticals, despite the fact that we uh, could potentially be interconnected. And um, so, you know, Stephen's working on one thing that um, has to do with himself. Dana's managed in a certain place. Dean is doing something. We um, at Pfizer and throughout the biopharmaceutical industry are working in our own verticals. And I really think that the pivot for us collectively around health is to move to um, a kind of a greater connectedness in all spheres. And let me give two, two examples. One is around uh, data connectedness. So we talk about data sharing. Uh, Dean made, I mean, uh, Stephen made the excellent point that you can't even get your own data. I can't even get it shared with me. What are we going to do about that? And there are a lot of really amazing opportunities to, um, uh, it, along that to open things up so that patients can have their own data and that they can share it as they desire. There's also a move to share data between uh, data aggregators or collectors. So you think about opportunities in biopharma, for example, where we're sharing data from each other's science so that we can amplify and advance the entire body of work in that space. And then you think about kind of the aggregator of aggregators, um, so kind of this open source where we've now aggregated in a very large way, how do we allow access to that by people who have uh, good questions, who are exercising their curiosity, um, that have come to these questions uh, through patient engagement and now need to find a place to answer those questions. So you see aggregation of data like with um, IMEDS at the FDA, um, the work at the collaboratory at the NIH, the work at uh, PCORI at the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute on PCORnet. So this aggregation of aggregated data and allowing access to answer questions. And at the end of the day, I think it's going to be getting to that last pivot in a fulsome way where people can share the individual data into this, that we can aggregate data and share it with each other, we can aggregate data and share it more broadly, that we'll be able to have Dana not answer the question with her curiosity in her living room, but to actually um, come to a data set that could answer it more broadly and then move it more quickly into the hands of others that need it. Well, and I, David, before we go to you, I want to also uh, pursue in the panel a discussion around um, is there something wrong with the idea that people have questions that they want answers for? Maybe we don't want each person to have to do it in their living room, or maybe they don't have the you know, wherewithal to do that. But I, I do think there is going to be room for all of the different you know, sort of pieces to fit together. David, I want to go to you. I read an article about um, some of the patients that you care for and how uh, you're really literally pulling science forward to try to treat patients uh, in real time. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you're sort of bringing past, present, future together in, in uh, TBI? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to represent the city of Pittsburgh and the communities of uh, the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon in this event. And one of the uh, most uh, enjoyable things that we're doing now is we are converting our focus from large-scale randomized studies that are focused on generating a p-value and a statistical result over into the world of the goal is actually to make the patient in front of us better. And if our research delivers that, who cares what the p-value is? So I would add to that that 
if the goal was to be inspired today, I was inspired by the three people who stood up and, and spoke. And, and Dean came in. Uh, the slope of change in science is remarkable. Polio was a public health scourge, and it took decades to deliver a vaccine. A year ago, most of us didn't even know what Zika was. And two weeks ago, teams of scientists at the University of Pittsburgh delivered a critical breakthrough on the path towards the Zika virus. So we will go from decades to months in measurement. And Stephen, some of the most important things that we're doing are derived from difficult questions that patients have asked me about their own health. And then Monica, I will tell you that it was just a very brief snippet, but hearing those mothers being asked what's important to you is something that we cannot discount. And the goal of so much research in spinal cord injury, for example, is directed towards getting people ambulatory. But when you ask the spinal cord injury patient, what is meaningful to you? They talk about the dignity of bladder control and the solace of less pain. And they will rank ambulation far further down the list. So the beautiful thing that's happening now is that we are clearly focused on team science. When I was an MD-PhD candidate, like your brother, I literally was in a windowless room by myself with an electron microscope, and now everything. We aren't even talking about big data anymore. We're now doing mega data. It's large teams, team science, collaboration, mega data to get us to where we need to go at a much faster pace. Fantastic. I, go ahead, Frida. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. So, um, yes, we were able in the case of Zika to move at lightning speed. But we haven't um, consistently been able to move everything forward at lightning speed. And I really think that is the pivot that all of the things that we're talking about give us an opportunity to do. So can we replicate um, with the urgency for the many other things that we've not uh, attended to um, the same as we have with Zika? And um, I'll just give you a, my personal example, which is um, my, um, my mother died in 1977 from a stroke. Um, I was a medical student at that time. When I look back at when data that could potentially have saved her life started rolling out of the Framingham study, it was 27 years before then. So, and frankly, it's not consistently different now. So the aha moments that we have in science through our research, either done individually or done collectively in some way, to the actual hands of the people who need it, who can either change their lives and lifestyle or that we can change the care that we provide for them is still way too long. And I think we have to figure out a way to take this amazing example on Zika, what we're doing with Ebola, and start attacking things like um, Alzheimer's um, in medical collaborations, where it's all hands on deck, we've got to fix this, and that to do that again and again and again until we've really tackled it all. I want to build on that. Um, I think you said something earlier about the ecosystem, and I think that's so critical in the team science aspect to think, because I think that's really what's going to shorten the time and shorten the knowledge sharing. What I've seen from the Open APS community, there are now 121 plus people around the world who have built systems like this for themselves. And what I'm hearing from these people is it's inspiring to know that it's possible, but it's important for us to share with the rest of the diabetes community and the industry who are also working on commercial solutions for these problems. That knowledge has to be shared, but there's not a framework. There's not an ecosystem right now where our knowledge from 375,000 plus hours of using these systems is shared back to the industry and is informing the development of what's going to come out in the commercial market. And I think that's a huge barrier for us moving forward more quickly. And that's the ecosystem I think we need to create and we need to work for where patients and individual innovators and caregivers and people at pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies and everybody comes together and is part of this ecosystem. System, and it's no longer about the silos. It's no longer about what hat we wear, but it's how are we going to solve these problems together and what are we going to do next and how quickly can we get there? So I think, let me just throw the questions out here because I think we're already off to the races. Um, so the, the system that you're describing and the verticals and the silos that are being described, this is, you know, sort of the uh, inflection point that I think we're currently at. And I think it's clear everyone in that system doesn't want to be in that silo anymore. Um, we've just completed a series of interviews to uh, prepare for the next administration on a transition team project, and 
uniformly everyone says, get me out of my silo, get me in the system, please connect the dots, I want to be part of prevention, I want to be part of delivery, uh, enough of this, you know, trying to go it alone. So how do we get there? What, where does this little, you know, Oz live and how do we build the road to Oz? Because uh, I worry that we can all talk about the system but we don't figure out the plan to get there. Is it just going to happen organically? Go ahead. Oh, I, I think it's already happened, frankly. And it is very challenging to succeed in any biomedical arena by yourself. And we've already done this organically, that if you want to successfully compete for whether, whether it's foundational dollars, philanthropic dollars, or federal dollars to support your research endeavors, if you aren't delivering what it, um, if you aren't delivering successes through team efforts, it's, it is almost impossible to succeed. But we are trying to use, I'll add that what we're trying to use our understanding of the principles of physics and engineering to control our surroundings and really to control the pace of science. But there's one tiny little problem which goes to your point of how do we translate the, the success of, of, of Zika to other arenas is that it still requires serendipity. We aren't in control of everything. And there are lots of people doing brilliant work that will culminate in failure. And science is more consistently failure than success. But you plug away. And the larger the team, the stronger the team, the more diverse the team from an intellectual perspective, the more likely your efforts are to capture that serendipity and translate it into success. I'm glad you brought up funding because I think that's the other piece of the puzzle. We need to have funding for all these areas to build this ecosystem. I want to prevent funding going from any team that does not have patient involvement in creating those questions, asking the questions, designing the research, because at the end of the day, if it's not useful for the patient, why are we doing it? But I'm also glad you brought up failure because I think communicating those failures is absolutely critical. Instead of science going to the journals when it succeeded, we need to be documenting and sharing when it's failed, what hasn't worked, and why. Maybe it didn't work for this population, but that needs to be communicated. So if I or another cohort comes along and says, well, I think that really will work for us, I want to try that and find if it will succeed elsewhere, we need to be able to, you know, have that transparent communication. And I think that documentation of failure is really important. Let me, let me ask James a question. Is it easy in the business community to stand up and say, I failed, uh, we didn't make a profit, and we didn't succeed? Um, because I wonder how easy it is for all of us to admit failure. I don't, you want to comment? <clears throat> well, I, I think the one anecdote that really made me laugh was uh, uh, something that Jeff Bezos said when the Amazon Fire Phone failed and he said, well, yeah, it failed and I hope to have more failures like that, hopefully bigger ones, um, because, you know, to him it meant that they were at least trying and, um, you know, to try and to fail bigger and bigger meant you were, you were aiming higher and higher. And so that, that was something that, that really resonated with me. I mean, hopefully we don't fail. We're not, we're not striving to fail, but, um, you know, I, I, think, I think it is difficult because in, in the commercial world, I mean, especially with consumers, brand means a lot. And, you know, you always have to think about the damages to your brand that, that come with failure. But, you know, I think what I try to do is really push our engineering teams to aim really high. And, you know, we, we, strike a, we try to strike a balance between, between success and failure, and hopefully, hopefully it's been working out over the years. But back, back to the data issue, I think one of, one of the things that I've noticed in talking with you know, a lot of providers of data and, and trying, to, trying to gain access to this data is that there's a lot of, there's not a lot of economic incentive that's in place for a lot of the, the commercial vendors. So I even if you look at, um, you know, integration between EMRs and EHRs, um, I was shocked to see that, well, everyone seems to want to do all this and share data. And then when you ask the question, well, why not? You know, there's some uncomfortable silence. And, you know, well, how hard is it to connect one hospital to another hospital? Well, it's not that difficult, but it costs $100,000, $150,000. So if you're doing a point-to-point -point integration between one hospital to another, you know, maybe that's acceptable in terms of the line item budget for hospital. But, you know, what if one hospital wants to connect to 100 hospitals? When, well, that becomes pretty untenable from a financial point of view. And so I think there's just um, a lot of financial economic disincentives to, to sharing data right now. So we I need to take a, a look at those. Can I, can Rita, I go ahead, and then David, I want you to comment too. My favorite uh, failure platform, 
um, is one that is happening at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And essentially, uh, we asked the question, um, what about all those medicines that have been in study in the biopharmaceutical industry that didn't kind of work out? What, what's going on with them? And the answer is many times they rest after their failures, if you would, um, and some of them are able to get back up and some of them not so much. And so uh, we were able to identify a number of companies, a large number of companies, with a large number of compounds that had failed in their initial indications. And the data around these are housed at the National Institutes of Health through this uh, program that then allows researchers who have hypotheses about other uses for these medicines to come in to see the data, in many cases to confer with the scientists who work on that, and then to apply that to new potential treatments. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but if you think about what it takes to develop a medicine and all of the work that goes into getting it into the clinic, um, to allow those to just fail once and sit is really a tragedy in many ways. And so this is a way of data sharing after a failure with a business that basically says, yes, we failed at this, but if there's another use for this, let's put it out here. Um, and, and make something really meaningful happen. And there's some really interesting and exciting unexpected science, to your point, Dana, that has come from places, um, you know, unusual in finding these solutions. And so I think that's an example um, of what you can do that has meaningful outcomes against your failures. Could it go faster? Um, it could go faster and it could go bigger. Um, uh, that, so I think faster and bigger is Well, that, that's, good. That, that's, that's a fantastic lesson for our policymakers and for the people at places like the National Institutes of Health to create repositories that enable um, previous work to be useful to the next set of investigators. My question, though, is why are we trying to get 100 hospitals to talk to each other? Why aren't we trying to get 100 hospitals to talk to one patient? And that is going to be vastly more simplified than trying to get 100 organizations with their own individual uh, motives, some of which are profit and some of which aren't, that have their own, their own set of priorities. We should be connecting those 100 hospitals to one patient. Can you unpack that a little bit, what you're talking about, in, ser in terms of the, the concept of, you know, let's focus, you talked about it earlier, focus on the patient and what do they need and go from that out to the system? Is that what you're saying? Instead yeah, well, of using existing systems. To, to, to care for Stephen Keating's problem mm -hmm. required how many different institutions and how many different doctors, but it's his tumor. That should be the focus. The center point is his health status, whether it's, whether it's disease or whether it's actual health. So the focus point is his health status and everything else should be connected to that. And whether it's through a wearable technology on your wrist or whether it's through something that is measuring objective data by uh, intermittently sampling your, your bloodstream, what, whatever that is, you can combine that with interfaces that allow for two-way communication between patients and providers, but it doesn't need to have 100 hospitals talk to each other, it just needs 100 institutions that can talk to the patient. So maybe it goes back to my cat food example. They're making the cat food availability everywhere I go on the internet. So why not do that a little bit more with what we need as patients? You were gonna say something. Yeah, I was just thinking about the idea of 100 different hospitals or 100 different clinical trials tapping into my data. Um, patients and people are generating so much data that's untapped, and there's so many barriers in the regulations and how we think about clinical trials that prevent researchers from working with these preferably donated sets of data, like no cost, please research with my data. And I've actually had three different researchers in the past year email me and say, you know, I don't think my IRB would let me take data that you collected last year if you handed it to me, but would you anonymize some data from your community and pass it along? And then if it's <laughs> donated and anonymized, I could, then, I could then do something with it. And I'm like, that's not my job, you know? It's absolutely crazy that patients are begging researchers to do something with this data, and we don't have, you know, that IRB ecosystem, that regulatory ecosystem to support that. And I think that's a huge problem. And so when I think about the connectivity, I also think about people like, you know, begging science, begging healthcare to do something with our data and move faster, and that there's just so many barriers there. Well, let me ask you a quick follow-up on that. I, I'm trying to be a good moderator. We've had some moderators in the pu public eye who've gotten a little... Um, flack lately, so I want to be a, a dominant moderator here. Um, so let me ask you this. 
are we putting too much burden on the individual patients or aggregate uh, numbers of patients? Because I attend a lot of these conferences too where people are saying, oh, let the patients do it. Oh, how about the patients? Are we um, sort of uh, letting go of some responsibility on the system? I think we are. I think the challenge with patients, and I see it in my role because I have a day job. I love it. I do this innovation stuff on, on nights and weekends. What's your day job? I work for the W2O group, and so I actually help healthcare companies connect with patients and doctors online. And it's fabulous, but it's not this. Um, and I am just one of those people who said, you know, I love what I do. I think I'm making a difference in healthcare in my day job. Um, and I think it's more effective for me to do this in my spare time. And there's tons of people who want to keep their day jobs or they're not able to give it up for financial reasons or whatever. Um, and there's some people who want to create a nonprofit, and that's great, or they want to create a startup, and that's great. And we need more people to enter the system, but we also need to build the ecosystem to support individual one-off part-time innovators. Maybe it's one time, maybe they're, you know, they do it over a couple of years, but I think we need to build up a system to provide more resources to support people at all these stages, because otherwise we're missing out on so much innovation and so much insight, because people just don't have the time and the resources to be able to step away from their day job or their day lives or their families to be able to do this. Frida. So, yeah, so um, absolutely. You know, we have Star Wars medicine and a Flintstone system. Um, you know, the, the idea, I mean, if you think about the, um, in many ways, archaic nature of how we move uh, things, issues, ideas from one place to the other, you know, it's Flintstones compared to what the science could bear for us right now. Is there something wrong with using our feet in our cars like they used in the Flintstones? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, so, so I think one of the, and there are a few opportunities like this that are, that are ongoing, which have taken the giant step back to try to answer uh, Dana's question. So what is it that actually stands between a patient with an idea, a willingness to share data, um, an innovator, researcher, whomever, to, um, to do the following things to get the outcome that are required. And um, we're finding that the barriers are uh, small and they can be overcome, except when people uh, hit upon them, they don't always have the clever solutions that Stephen had to you know, apply for medical school. So, um, you know, so we need to find simpler <laughs> solutions for those. And there are some collaboratives, consortia, groups that are literally trying to answer that question. What does the on-ramp look like? What does the connection look like? How do you get IRBs? Um, to answer questions that they've never been asked before, right? How do you get them um, educated and, um, and settled in to answer the questions we know are coming? And those things are ongoing. Um, and patient input is another one. I just have to say this out loud. The Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Um, again, we've uh, worked for several years after the establishment of this in the Affordable Care Act to find the right way to get patient voices, ones that are pulled together as Monica has done, ones that raise their hands uh, as individuals as Dana has done, ones that are coming together as um, James has put us together to do, the ones that David sees every day, to try and say what really does matter to you. Um, how can we measure that? How will the regulators uh, respond to that? How can you share your data with us? And these things are being asked and answered kind of every day um, in little bits and pieces. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll really have some of the answers and we'll be able to trigger pull. So I think we're soon out of time, but I wanna uh, talk about how this is, you know, sort of science of patient input, the data needs, you know, the citizen scientists, I think officially the genie's out of the bottle, right? We, we know that uh, patient input is kind of the blockbuster drug going forward, but we've been talking a lot about still we have challenges in the system. So I want each panelist to uh, share, you know, what do you think one step could be that we could start to break through some of these barriers? I'll start with you. I think um, President Obama actually said it really well in his Wired article. He was talking about regulations related to AI, but I think if you swap out AI and you put in healthcare, it, it's the same thing. It's about there's a thousand innovations out there, and we need a regulatory ecosystem that is a broad guiding set of principles. It's not trying to get this to fit, you know, this is a round peg and fit it in a square hole. Um, I think that's absolutely key for designing the system, knowing that we don't know what technologies are going to come next. We don't know what the next innovation is or who the next innovator will be, but creating that system and having the regulatory principles to help guide us and to be supportive of all those people. Um, and the other thing just is to remember that for a patient, a barrier may look small to those of us who work in healthcare or deal with healthcare, but living with a disease, it's like death by a thousand paper cuts. Like you have to fight every single day to live. 
you make 300 choices or more a day to live, and that's a lot of work to do for a patient, and then to do all this other innovation stuff and to be a part of the solution. So yes, the barriers are small, but I would encourage you guys, if you take one thing away from today, in addition to the hope, is try to remove one of those small barriers, because that might be the paper cut, that last, you know, the, the breaking point for a patient who can and will want to be involved in designing the future with us. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, and when you brought up regulatory, if I didn't mention that we need to have just as much a sound uh, FDA, well-funded, et cetera, as we do the NIH. Um, why don't you go next and talk about that taking one barrier away at a time? Yeah, I think it's, for us, it's, you know, I agree, a lot of it has to do with the regulatory issues. Um, you know, so for instance, there's clearly an appropriate level of concern around patient safety and privacy. Um, and I can't really speak to how effective HIPAA will be or is in its current form for a, for a new world in healthcare. But what I can say is, you know, it's, it's an incredible burden on companies to comply with a lot of aspects of current regulation. I mean, we literally have attorneys that sit in on product and engineering meetings because we have to be very sure that we're doing the right things around where we store data, how we store data, how data flows between different internal systems, how data flows from our systems to outside partners and vice versa. Um, and there's not a lot of clarity. I mean, if you ask five different lawyers about whether we're in compliance with HIPAA, you know, a lot of times you get five different answers. So we just try to make a best effort and, and hope we're doing the best thing for um, everyone in the ecosystem. Uh, similarly, you know, we talk about AI and healthcare. Um, you know, I know the FDA is actually pretty forward-looking in this, but if you think about um, how you use data intelligence to make better decisions around screening and diagnosis in healthcare, um, you know, I think there needs to be a lot of flexibility in, for instance, in the way that uh, medical and health software is approved and released. You know, if you look at deep learning systems versus rule-based systems of the past, I mean, deep learning systems get better as you feed it more data, but do you have to wait and approve every release of a new data set that improves your algorithms? I hope not because, you know, I hope that we'd want patients to get access to the best data and the best algorithms that use this data as quickly as, as, as it's allowed. So, a so couple I'm, things. Thank you. I'm going to go David and then Frida, you can have the last word. Uh, sure. This, this may seem esoteric, but I, I'm a, a professor at a major research university and a neurosurgeon in a very large healthcare system. And the reward system that is based uh, that is that is in place for my career advancement and for the those around me is predicated not on the accomplishments of your team but on what you can uh, justify for yourself and that that also needs to be revolutionized and I, I'm reminded of of again what Deed said this morning about the cynics versus the optimists and the cynics who politically run our in our organizations um, need to figure out a way to get out of the way of the optimists who are actually driving things forward and, and create the proper environment that, that allows for the optimists and their success to see the light of day and, and to be properly acknowledged and rewarded. So I don't know if you fit the millennial profile or not in terms of your age, but is there maybe change on the horizon in terms of new generations who won't want to be incented the same ways? I hope so. That is a that's a that's a taller task and a slower road, um, but it does it takes vision and and the more we have genuine visionaries rising into higher leadership positions inside of these organizations, you know, our IRB when when Apple uh, released the health app. I, I called our IRB the next day and said, you better believe that I'm going to have an option related to this for one of my research studies. What's the answer? And of course, the answer is no. <laughs> we, need, we need the people who can say yes to have a higher degree of influence than these large, large swaths of people whose job it is to say no. All right, Frida, how are we going to rise up here? Yeah, so... Oh. Only because they took all of mine. Um, <laughs> pushed in the corner have, here. I know no, actually, I'm not. <laughs> I've known you long enough. I did. Know. I had a list of ten, so thank goodness. Um, that, was just her, that was her setup so, here. Yeah, yeah. The, so here's my one. It, it really is um, finding a way to more holistically 
involve patients. Um, I, I'll call her out, I don't see her uh, with the lights on, but Sharon Terry told me once, you know, we've been talking about, there she is, we've been talking about patient engagement for about 20 years, we, we want to be married. So I think it's time for us to really marry patients, to find the right way to ask the questions, and not just to ask them what they want, the questions that they want, but to involve them uh, really at every step of the way in how we're going to answer those questions. Um, and to have them involved as completely as possible every step of the way, beginning and end, to, to end. And I think that that's going to empower us all in um, a way that we've never been, you know, kind of turbocharged before. Fantastic. So we're going to put a ring on it, guys. We're going to the future. Uh, we're bringing science forward. I hope that you'll join me in thanking these amazing panelists and the ones that went before us.